everyone. Welcome to, this is series five of my With Tracy podcast. And I'm delighted to kickstart the series. We have not one, but two guests, a very academic duo, in fact, with multiple degrees between them. They are leading the way in their approach to education and helping both parents and students get through the exam years without the stress, but with the results. Between them, they have over 30 years experience in the education sector and met while training to be teachers. Hmm. And there's something to do with a motorbike, the story which I'm going to be quizzing them more about later. Paul and Emily set up the Parent Guide to Education in 2019. And their motto is, knowledge beats nagging every time. Then 2020 loomed and like so many companies, they had to alter their business model. That same year, Emily published the GCSE Survival Guide for Parents and became a regular across TV, radio, offering advice on Good Morning Britain, Radio 2 and 5 Live, just to name a few. Okay, there's cats, footballer, football, sorry, and killer creme brulees also play a significant part in their lives, which I find really intriguing and leaves me in no doubt but I'm really going to enjoy chatting with Paul and Emily today. In their words, we coach parents to not just help their teenagers to pass exams, but also to develop the kind of skills that will set them up for the next challenges they face. Paul and Emily, welcome to the With Tracy podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, well, thank what, you for having us. What an introduction, thank you very much. I'm sat here thinking this must sound wonderful, good day. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my Desert Island disc kind of <laughs> take on my intros. <laughs> I'm sure they'd have something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, a big welcome, thank you so much. Um, now, everyone who does listen will know that my first question is always, to ask my guests if they give us a little bit of background, a little bit of back history on kind of where they came from or come from and any interesting snippets. So over to you guys. I'll go first then, right. So um, yeah, I'm Emily. I grew up locally, we're, we're in Peterborough and um, went to the local community school and always really quite liked school. I've always been fairly academic, I think. And so somehow, still not entirely sure how I managed to get myself into Cambridge University, which was quite cool. So I've, I've experienced both sides of that and then spent 15 years as a teacher. That was kind of what I'd always wanted to do, went all the way through uni and planned it all out, had these big career aspirations. And, um, and then after about 15 years, teaching was not quite the place that I'd expected it to be when I went in and uh, had a bit of a mental health wobble and decided that my sanity was more important than my salary yeah. so uh, decided I needed to do something different and uh, following lots of soul searching figured out that I do actually have some transferable skills other than just being a teacher and uh, and yeah long story very short the parent guide to education was born so yeah. uh, so yeah Oh well, Should thank you. I know we're going to cover. I know we're going to cover some of that other stuff in a bit more detail later, because I'm sure people listening will think, "Oh, you know, they're going to latch onto that." But how about you, Paul? What's I think I've I should have gone first because I can't <laughs> beat the Cambridge University thing, can I? Um, I, I uh, oh, but I, tell them how many primary schools you went to. Oh I, yeah, well that's what part of my story, I guess, is I went to a, a bajillion primary schools because I was an RAF brat, I suppose. Uh, parents in the RAF so therefore did the rounds and eventually got uh, pushed off to boarding school uh, which you know sounds horrendous but I loved it personally and uh, but when I uh, left school and went to uni and I was kind of based around Peterborough um, most of the last few RAF bases my dad was at were in the local Peterborough region so I kind of stayed here and uh, then I I, I got a proper job uh, rather than teaching I'm going to call it um, I worked <laughs> in banking and uh, yeah, long story short, had uh, twin boys, gave up banking because I wasn't seeing them, became a full-time parent, which is the best job in the whole world. Oh, uh, and then at nice. some point, apparently, once you've had children, you've got to go back to work. So I delayed <laughs> as long as possible, and, uh, but I retrained to become a teacher. And on day one, I met Emily. So. Oh, 
Yeah. So there we go. That's how you two are together. So, OK, great. Thank you very much for that. So we're going to just do a little bit. Emily, I want to come back to what you said, because I'm quite intrigued about why you two chose mathematics. Um, so what, yeah, what drove you to choose math? And did you already have this inkling that you wanted to be a teacher? Because you, I know you did mathematics with education or, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, as a, as a kid, I always really enjoyed looking after the smaller kids. If nothing else, it gets you out of all the other responsibilities you're supposed to have, which is always great. Um, so we used to finish at one o'clock on a Friday at my school and have enrichment time, which meant all sorts of different things. But I used to go back to my old primary school and help out with the, the reception class. Absolutely loved it. Um, kind of always knew I wanted to teach. Whether it was primary or secondary was always a bit of a toss up. But I always knew I, I either wanted to teach or I wanted to sing in the West End because I also love performing. Um, I love and that. She's a diva. I am, a little bit. Uh, and I'd always loved maths. I like the fact that it's right or it's wrong and you can prove that you're right rather than all the various grey areas and things. I mean, Paul would disagree because he says I talk a lot, but I quite like just that really succinct it's right or it's wrong thing. Always really enjoyed maths, was always good at it, was always my strongest subject. So when I applied to uni, it was mostly for maths courses. There was one where it was a joint maths with dance, which was very random. Thankfully, oh. I didn't get that. Not sure how that would have worked. Um, but uh, maths with education seemed to be a really sensible way to do it because it got that, both sides of the equation for me. See what I did there with the equation? <laughs> oh, yes. Like that. And, and it, it meant the course that I was on meant that by the time I'd finished, I would be a qualified teacher. So that was that was then a bit of a no brainer. I think I applied on a bit of a whim and didn't really expect it to happen. And then went for the interview, talked about all the experience I had with with teaching. I'd done uh, work as a teaching assistant, voluntary work when I was in sixth form with the younger classes and, and so on. And I, they offered me a place. And at that point, it was like Cambridge have offered me a place kind of have to go now <laughs> so it was it was weird because I didn't see myself as a Cambridge sort of a person um but I think it helped because it's the education side of Cambridge it wasn't one of the super fancy schmancy colleges where it was full of uh, private school kids and and so on it was a bit more I, I could be a bit more me which I think otherwise would have really put me off going to one of the central colleges I does that it would have been really intimidating I think mm. it was bad enough where I was but yeah I absolutely loved it there and um, it's a beautiful beautiful city so it was mm. and, and really handy to pop home and you know, get my yeah. to do the washing at the weekends yeah. so I know that I'm going to go a bit here but I'm just intrigued was there a crossover with the other colleges did you or was it very separate it was fairly separate actually so my first year was all maths and I absolutely loved it and then after that it became more about the education side of things it was a lot more essay based which I'm not sure I'd quite realized when I went but um but yeah still really interesting really really um really good fun there were some lovely people on my course so it was uh it was great yeah well brilliant and I mean great for you I mean that's fantastic so, Paul, your turn. Now, I've got to read this because you've got various degrees. You've got geography and ICT. But from your bio, obviously, it says you've got business studies, child care and development and health and social care. And I love this bit, you know, not um, becoming head of hair and beauty at one point. So <laughs> we need you to elaborate. <laughs> well, I mean, the two degrees, so one was geography and one was computing, IT, whatever it's called this week. Uh, and that that was that was what kind of got me into teaching IT or computing, I guess. Um, in terms of the the other departments you mentioned, that was basically as I was a head of department, I was the head of ICT at my school. And with I guess cost cutting, I cut it's going back a few years, but they basically wanted to get rid of heads of department and sort of amalgamate smaller departments to save cash, that kind of thing. So I ended up in charge of IT, computing, business studies health and social care and uh, and they thought well who can do head of hairdressing and and for whatever reason uh, I was the man so uh, and that's probably my, my, my finest achievement to date I would like to think so <laughs> everyone seems to think it's funny I don't understand why 
I don't know if Emily wants to say anything. I feel that I I shouldn't. But for anyone who's listening and can't see us. <laughs> we, we had to lend him wigs for them to test things out on him. Let's go with that. Yes, yes. But also, <laughs> uh, I think I'm possibly abusing my position of power. I did uh, Movember once. So I grew uh, lots of lots of facial hair, but then I took said facial hair to the hairdressing department and said, look, I need a bat stash. Can you shape it into and dye it into the shape of the, the, Batman, the, the logo. Batman logo? And they did. Um, I thought I looked amazing. but I really used to go anywhere with him. Yeah, and we <laughs> seem to think differently. So. Well, I mean, my my imagination is going, you know, mad. Uh, this is at this point, really. I would love, I'd love a photo of you <laughs> with your your beard at that point. <laughs> uh, it, it does exist. Yeah, I'll try and track you one down. <laughs> that would be great, actually. That would be really good fun. Now, Paul, you mentioned earlier that you both met each other while you were doing your teacher training. And um, and I mentioned also in my intro about this motorbike story. So, guys, you've got to tell us now about this motorbike story because you don't elaborate on your website and now it's in the intro. So, Well, I mean, there's a few years between the two events because we started teaching together on the same day, January the 4th-ish, uh, 2003. Or four, one of the two and um so that was teacher training separate departments all that kind of stuff and we were married to other people at the time which uh, you know uh, I, I had uh, i had twin boys so i was a father i was a parent etc and you know um it was very difficult to see my fellow trainees so occasionally i would be allowed out to the pub and uh, i'd sort of run into my fellow trainees emily being one of them and long long story short uh, a couple of well one very messy divorce later and one sort of less messy divorce um you know we still knew each other through our first day at school and what have you and we just got talking and that about is where divorces, yeah. about divorces and that's where motorcycles came in yes so i am um, in the divorce got to keep my motorcycle and um, he got the car. So when Paul and I decided we were going to meet up for a coffee, I rocked up to his house on my bike in full motorcycle leathers. And I think that might have been one of the trick. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but if we've been recorded, I can't say anything. <laughs> uh, but yes, it did. Or well, you can say something, you know, you can you kind of work your way around that one. Yeah. I, I could deny it, but there's no point. Um, yeah, it was, uh, and yeah, that was what, 2007, and it's been a, a kind of roller coaster ever since. It's been well, not even a roller coaster. It's been fabulous ever since because uh, you know, um, from from day one, it's been. Yeah. But having now lived together, worked together, um, have child together, um, are married together, etc. <laughs> and and it's been surprisingly easy. Um, you know you. I know we've all going through lockdown and things. We some of us have have realised that we're not so great when we're with our partner twenty four seven. Yeah, we've all heard the stories. Whereas we were just we were just fine. We were just chilled. Um, but it's it's like getting to hang out with your best friend all day. So it works. And mm. um, we had a, a slight blip early on. And um, we, we just did. had Paul's third work anniversary where he he was officially full time in the business, and it was reminding me of the story because. We're about two two weeks in, maybe, and both sat working in the lounge. We didn't have offices in the old house, so sat working in the lounge. And um, Paul suddenly piped up with, "We need to talk." It's like, have I two weeks? What have I done? And he helpfully followed it up with, "This isn't working," and I'm panicking. Turns out. I may occasionally talk to myself while I'm working a little bit. And as a very well-trained husband, Paul knows that he should be listening, just in case it gets expensive. Because yes, it is, is dangerous sometimes when you weren't <laughs> listening. And I was just distracting him from his work. So at that point, we decided we needed to work in separate rooms. From then on, it's all been smooth sailing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when she <laughs> says talk to herself a little bit, it's, it's a monologue, it's a constant. But is she talking to me I or not? I'm self-employed, yeah. it's a business meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually talking to yourself, it can be quite helpful. Because especially if you are on your own, it's kind of like you air something. And when you air it, it kind of, it's not all here jumbled in your head. It's suddenly out there and you can kind of see it or think about it in a slightly different way. That's, you know, I, I have to admit to putting my hand up, but I do occasionally talk to myself, possibly not quite the way you do, but I do. And, but I've always decided that it was kind of 
quite a therapeutic thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, because I you come back to or somebody who's there with you. Anyway, yeah. that's my theory. <laughs> yeah, I, I occasionally will tell Paul, I just need to talk at you for a minute or two. Can you just, just smile and nod? I need to just talk it out. And to be very clear, she, I think she has voices in her head as well. So sometimes, you know, yeah. they're internal. Yeah, conversations, that's good. <laughs> I think it's all very healthy. <laughs> but that kind of, well, I hope it doesn't really, but it kind of brings me on because, Emily, you mentioned it earlier, that you said you had your mental health wobble. Now, um, and, that, and that ultimately set you on the path to set up your own business. But I know this is something, you know, mental health today, is something that, you know, if I believe it affects everyone actually in one form or another um and so I think it really is something that we should all talk about and be aware of so would you do you mind sharing a little bit about your your sort of story your journey yeah, it's fine. I agree it's it's important to talk about it yeah. because you know it doesn't matter if you have a fabulous support system or a terrible one it's it's not about that it's a chemical imbalance in your brain yeah. for me I I think as a result of long-term stress so I'd had um, a couple of bad bosses in a row and was just I was at the point where I was driving to work every day crying and just thoroughly miserable and what normally happens as a teacher so ask any teacher they'll tell you that they get towards the end of any holiday and the last couple of days before you go back you start to have the nightmares of I, I don't know you've been suddenly instantly put in charge of a field trip and half the kids have gone missing or they've asked you to teach physics but in Spanish or something and you start to get the, the panic I was getting that from the start of the Christmas holidays I was mm. I was just I couldn't switch off I couldn't unwind I was still getting emails from one of said bosses across the Christmas period and Paul said he said, if it's making you feel like this, then you need to take a break. You need to just, even if it's just take a week off and, and get your head straight, you can get yourself signed off if necessary with, with stress, but because it's kind of the route you have to go down with, with teaching, you know, just you can't go back like this. And I think because I then gave myself permission to stop coping for a week, I just broke. I think I've been clinging on by a thread. And knowing that I didn't have to do that anymore, I think my brain just went, oh, phew, and just stopped. And it was a moderate to severe bout of depression. I was pretty much useless for a couple of months and went with antidepressants, which started to make me feel better, but also worse because of the side effects, because yeah. that takes a little while to settle in and get through. And thankfully Paul is brilliant Shh, don't tell him I told you because he'll get a big head but Honestly, it's all true <laughs> but he was amazing because I I knew I was useless and I knew I couldn't do anything and it was like you know when you go to the dentist and they put some anesthetic in so you can't feel anything and you kind of you poke yourself and but you can't feel it and you mm -hmm. want to bite your tongue or your lip to test it but you know you can't because that's very very dangerous it's it true. was like that had happened but to my emotions Mm -hmm. So I couldn't feel anything, couldn't feel happy, couldn't especially feel sad, just grey. Everything was just grey. And so I was useless, just mm -hmm. useless. And I knew I was and I couldn't do anything about it. And I just had to explain to Paul that it's not anything that you're doing. It's not that you are you don't make me happy. It's just that I can't be happy right now. Just, mm -hmm. just let's just write it out. Mm -hmm. and uh, And we did. And mm -hmm. we got to the point where I was well enough to go on to a new school which helped except that then I got there and found that the, the new boss the second of the two bad bosses was um about as bad as the first boss oh. and I could feel myself wobbling again I could yeah. feel it, it I was kind of an anxious tight chest yeah. kind of feeling and I I started to think I, I can't do this again I can't do this to me I can't do this to Paul no. I, I can't and that was where it started kind of percolating almost that idea of what else could I do yeah. I've got to find something even if it's a side hustle just to 
to gradually get me out and part time, yeah. which is what I did to begin with. So I started a branch of Lucy's Pop Choir. So my little sister Lucy started her own choir up in York. They're now she's got eleven choirs across the country. One of which is is mine wow. here in Peterborough, and it's something that I love doing. And I do two nights a week. It's a, a part time thing, but it brings oh, in some brilliant. income. So I didn't didn't feel like I was letting the family down by not being at work. And uh, yeah, that was the beginning of the, yes, I can step away from teaching. I can not be in the classroom and I can still be you know, useful and pay the bills. And how lovely, Emily, that you get to sing. Oh, I love it. It's it's like therapy. I mean, how really. lovely is that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's my happy place. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I think for a lot of people, um, yeah, I mean, mental health is one of those things. And you know, there's a stat that says the majority of people don't leave their jobs because of money. It's because of a bad leader or a bad boss. Yeah. And, you know, and that still stands today. And that's that shouldn't be the case. And um, I don't I, I've been there as well in terms of how people you know come in in companies that I've worked with. They're absolutely terrible. They really cannot manage people. Mm. And, you know, they might have the skill level to be doing a certain thing, but. I, I truly believe that you shouldn't be at certain levels if you cannot manage people. It should be an absolute requisite. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter what your CV says, and, and this is no slur, but what whatever exams or, degrees, yeah. or you know. Um, yeah. Um, Emily skipped over it, but the, the email that sort of broke the, uh, was the straw that broke the camel's back was it sent on something like the 27th of December. And it was, um, I need X, Y, and Z on my desk the day we go back. And it was it was a lot of work to do. It basically might as well said during your Christmas holiday, you are going to be working to produce this information yeah. for me. I don't care what else you've got going on. And and this is on back of lots of stuff beforehand. Yeah. Was, why would you send that? You can't you can't send that in any kind of good conscience no. unless you're trying to push them over the edge. It was a genuine. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Emily showed it to me. It's like, am I am I getting this wrong? Am I reacting? Nope. It's ridiculous, and you need yeah. to. Yeah. I, I think, you know, people, I know bullying is probably a really strong word, but I, that's actually what I think. I've witnessed yeah. it and, and mm. devastating effects. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, there's still a lot of people out there and I think there's still, it needs to be, people need to be trained properly. And yeah, sometimes these things need to be rethought, but listen, I'm so pleased that you managed to get through it, obviously having Paul there. One question I did want to ask, Emily, did you, at that stage, did you still talk to yourself or did you, did you kind of, was it a silent time for you? I, it was, I, I wasn't thinking, there wasn't anything going on in my brain at that point, so there no. wasn't anything to talk out. It's, um, I, I think when I talk to myself, it's my, my thinking process. Yeah. And there was just nothing going on. It was like, you know, you know, the Homer Simpson with the, just the monkeys, dun, 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 with yeah. the symbols, it was like that, nothing. No. And it was incredibly frustrating because I have always been quite academic. I like problem solving, mm. I'm very much an ideas person and I was just blank and it was awful, but you know. All right, I, I, I can ask you one thing. I didn't feel awful because I didn't feel anything. No, but I'm going to ask you just one more question, um, because I do think this is a really important topic. And, um, but did you feel when you came out of it, did you think that was a gradual process or was there almost a day or a time when you, you kind of got through a 24 hour period or something and thought, I think I've, I think I can see light at the end of the tunnel. I feel different today. I think it was a very gradual thing. I don't yeah, okay. remember a, a day yeah. that made a difference, but I know... Uh, it certainly made me far more aware when I find myself starting to spiral. You know, sometimes when you just get a bit overwhelmed and I'm yeah. spiraling slightly, I will now very deliberately go, do you know what? There is nothing too important that I can't just put it off and have a mental health, even a half a day of just vegetating in front of the TV, letting my brain switch off, whatever it is I need to do. Yeah. So I don't start to go further down that spiral. Yeah. I'm quite careful about protecting my mental health now, my my emotions and stuff. So it's um, it's been a, a process because before I was always the person who went, yeah, I yeah. Can. yeah, of course I can. Yeah. yeah, I don't need to sleep. It'll be fine. I'll make yeah. something. I'll organise it. 
and I didn't didn't put myself I didn't give myself the space that I needed to yeah. because I was always trying to make everyone else happy yeah. and now I think I'm much better at looking after me yeah, yeah. I, I think it's an amazing thing a lot of people that I've spoken to you know it's those people quite often that have been very strong always there very positive um I want to say control, but <clears throat> excuse me, people feel that it can come to them. But actually, when it happens, you know, and they have to take a step back and have mental health, it's more of a shock because you can't believe it's happening to you. And so I think that almost becomes a harder thing because you're having to deal with that, thinking, Am I going mad? Or, you know, what is this? So this couldn't can't possibly be me. But I mean, it's just, it's great to hear your story. And I know there's a lot of other people out there that they, you can come through it. It does take time. Um, and for all those leaders and bosses out there, please be so aware, you know, yeah. of what you're doing and how, how leading people and managing people is such, you know, a responsibility and important role. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, but amongst all that, you, 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 so you started to think about, you know, doing your own thing. And then you um, so you set up the parent guide to education. So I'm going to say the initial focus was on helping parents getting their teenagers through GCSEs. Would you like to now explain exactly about your business? Because I because I think you're better equipped at that than I am. <laughs> Much better. There you go, Chris. <laughs> Um, so we we realised um, somebody a parent in our daughter's year group posted in the, the parent Facebook group they've got this homework it's bar modeling I think they're in like year six at the time how do I help her with that because it's something we never learned maths like that it's a, a new concept and and as a parent I mean fronted adverbials what I have no clue I looked around and went people are helping students as revision guides and tutors and all of the things so many businesses helping students yeah couldn't find anyone helping parents no one and the boys were about to do their GCSEs I think at the time and so you know as teachers we felt fairly equipped to support them through stuff they didn't want to listen to our advice because we're no. the parents what could yeah. we possibly know oh yeah but, totally <laughs> but then that helped us figure out what was needed in terms of the business which was somebody needed to support parents and give them the answers. How do you actually help your child? But how do you do it in a way that doesn't get shot down? Because, you know, teenagers, I still, as an adult, I, think I was, I don't know, I was definitely very an, an adult. Mum said to me, you should really read the Harry Potter books. You'll really like them. I think that I think you'll think they're wonderful. So I deliberately did not read the Harry Potter books for ages because I didn't want her to be right like just on principle so we have a stealth system we do stealth tips every week if you haven't got that relationship going with your child because they're in their defensive phase or where you can talk to them about stuff here's how you can start that conversation in a, a non to them threatening or judgmental or condescending or whatever mm -hmm. manner you know the, the reasons that they put up the defenses so we help parents not only understand what's going on, because if you know what's happening, it's not so scary. Yeah. Your teenager won't tell you any of this stuff, but also help them to support their child in that slightly sneaky little way. That means they don't feel like you're checking up on them. They just feel like you're on their team because, you know, you're, you're on the same side. It's not a battle. <laughs> so we wanted to do something that, that made parents mm -hmm. feel confident that they could support their child and not feel frustrated that they just didn't know what to do to help. Hmm. So uh, we planned it all out and yeah. It also comes back to um, from parents evening point of view, we've hmm. been teachers, we've been on both sides of the desk at parents evening and let's just go, it's a five minute slot and it, it's kind of pointless because you sit down uh, maybe half an hour late because they normally run behind time before we did the, mm -hmm. yeah, the online stuff. And um, by the time the teacher said, uh, right, they're really well behaved or not well behaved, um, this is where they came the latest test and this is what we're doing this term, you've got about a minute, a minute and a half left. So if you wanted to have the conversation about, you know, how can they improve? What, what sort of, um, what can they do about their study skills? What can they do to, to make sure they've covered all the content? You know, you literally haven't got the time to do it. Yeah. And, you know, as a teacher, it's frustrating because you kind of push them out of the way, the next one's come in and you repeat the process. 
there is no time to help those parents to help their ch child improve at that particular subject so we kind of we, we've had that frustration from both sides and, and and i think what we do also kind of gives parents a place to go to say right then you know, in terms of how they need to revise better what should they be doing how many hours what you know, how do you do a revision all those kind of things we can uh, we can help with and that's kind of what we set out to do yeah and, and i mean schools are progressively getting more and more underfunded and teachers are more and more overworked because they keep taking funding out of the system whatever they try and tell you and schools just don't have the time much as they'd love to give that individual attention and answer all of the questions there just isn't time so we've um we've had some some amazing feedback from people that just just the difference that it makes if nothing else to their confidence and their relationship with their child yeah. because if you feel like you're constantly nagging that's a horrible way to spend at least two years it's just it, it's no good for anyone and it, it can be a, a relationship breaker for for a while until they get through that teenage phase into you know young adults who kind of get it a little bit more so we're uh, we, we try and do not just the academic stuff but all of the things you know we, we've been going seven months <laughs> seven months when exams were cancelled because of the pandemic oh. so at that point as you said at the beginning we had to to alter the business model yeah. completely. we weren't preparing kids for exams through their parents we were preparing kids for the next stage so the parent guide to post 16 happened much sooner than i think we'd originally planned to bring it in because yeah. We wanted a way to support those parents through the next steps. And I mean, Paul was a, a sixth form tutor for most of his career and lead UCAS tutors. So personal statements, university applications, they are his superpower. But he's really been able to come into his own with that side of the business because that's doing one to ones with students. That's yeah. what kind of lights you up. Mm. That the bit where you get the emails from all the parents and the students like, oh, my gosh, Paul, that's so amazing. We've got all these offers from all of our universities. There's no living with him, I tell you. I do love it though. It is, you know, it, I do miss that side of teaching, the kind of working with students and watching them make progress and, and, and get offers back and the excitement and it's it's fabulous. And the fact that we can continue that through the, the parent guide to post 16 is, is brilliant. So I just would like to ask you, um, how so how did you go about setting it up? I, I did lots of planning of things. So I think at that point, having been really stressed out, really overworked as teachers, our biggest frustration constantly was things like family time. We weren't getting to spend the quality time with the kids that we wanted because we were constantly working. If one of them got an award in assembly, you'd have to beg, borrow or steal that beginning of the day off and you'd have a very hard deadline that you had to be back for. So instead of enjoying it and watching mm -hmm. them smile and be really proud, you'd be clock watching and figuring out your exit route if they were still going when you had to run out and i mean there was we, one horrific you know um, award that uh, our daughter got and it, it was they kept mentioning all these other children beforehand which is fine because they absolutely deserve their award i'm sitting there internally thinking would you just get on with it can you get to our child please all yeah. because i had to be back at school at 9 30 and it's made very clear to me if i'm not back at 9 30 there's going to be all sorts of well, they dock and you it a was... half day's pay don't because you missed a yeah. half day at that point yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. just and then you, you 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 literally run out you don't say well done to your daughter you have the photo yeah. taken that you normally do i'm out to the car i'm sort of you know probably driving a bit quicker <laughs> than, and, and then you're running from the car park to the sky like, yeah so we we very deliberately wanted to plan something that mm -hmm. was manageable and we didn't want to have to hustle our way through this so we we mapped it out and we went well we we know this stuff we know what we want to deliver to members each week so they get a weekly email that says right now at this point in the year in year 10 for example this is what you want to be thinking about and then we just recorded each weekly email as a video so we built up the content as we went so we then cycle through that every single year because it's always the same for all of the kids. And then we do one coaching call a month now. So it's all carefully managed so that we can scale it without having to give up our entire lives to, you know, dealing with customer support and all of the things and dealing with members all of the time and creating new content constantly and getting on that hamster wheel of yeah. craziness. So 
I, I designed what I wanted it to do. I did a lot of research on things like ways to run memberships that are best for members and best for you and, and tailoring everything to make it work. I'm quite a big ideas kind of person, but I'm also, once I've got that, I'm okay at then going down in the details and saying, so that means I need to do this, 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 and this, and this. I think what Emily is not mentioning here is that once <laughs> she's uh, an enormous geek, the, the cleverest person you could ever meet, she's got a brain of about 40 people. <laughs> if she wants anything doing, she will literally do it and she will work solidly from whatever time she has this, this idea until it's delivered. And, and if that is at sort of 10 o'clock at night and, and then she'll have a yeah, decent line in the morning, but she's, because you, you've got this flexibility to do what you want, she's very good at looking after herself and taking time off. But when that idea comes, yeah. she's just like, I've got to finish this thing. It's going to be shiny and pretty and it's going to be amazing for our members. And, and it is, and but she just can't not bring it to life more or less. I get too excited about it. If, if I didn't have Paul to, you know, bring me food and drinks every so often, I'd probably be dead by now. I would my computer <laughs> the skeleton. Uh, it is true. It, <laughs> it is, is very true. true. So would you mind telling me what some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you set up your business? Ooh. I was going with marketing, yeah, possibly. Yeah, I was going to say. Great at teaching. When it comes to marketing, that's a whole whole different skill set yeah. but luckily Emily is a genius who loves to read so uh, I think you went through a stage of having how many uh, business books have you got on your kindle about 93 and she's probably read most of them at least twice and just if there's a good idea she's like oh, split this in there it's amazing and, and so she's you yeah, know very good at kind of uh, and I'm not gonna go making up as we go along I mean we we have had mentors yeah uh, you know uh, yeah, yeah. Some, some have been brilliant and um, some not so brilliant but um, been really handy in our business journey so far so yeah, yeah it was just it was the, the salesy side of things because we're used to um a, you know a captive audience almost of <laughs> teenagers I mean you kind of I used to have to sell algebra to them but that was different and um, it it feels very odd. Pricing ourselves has mm. also been a challenge because we were used mm. to being in a, a public sector, you know, very sensible levels of pay that kept getting frozen every single year. But, you know, we, we could tell you what we earned per hour and that was, you know, there you go, we're, we're worth that much per hour. Whereas actually, no, do you know what? We're 30 years teaching experience between yeah. us, that mm. it's not what what you're charging isn't just what you are worth per hour you're also charging for the the years of experience and effort and mm -hmm. serving that have led mm -hmm. up to that point and that that's exactly. taken a uh, while and we still still find ourselves apologizing almost for, for for wanting to charge but that's what everyone does in in all of their businesses whether they work mm -hmm. for somebody or have their own business so it still seems a little bit odd and i i'm not comfortable with it but we we, we need to get better Mm. Well, I mean, I think that's like a lot of businesses, even for me and my consultancy, and I know there's a lot of people out there, you know, if you've come from that corporate sector and then you go out on your own, it is kind of like, oh, ha, oh, oh, I, I don't know, am I worth that much? You know, what I, but you realise that actually what you're offering and how you're helping people and you're absolutely right, your experience, that's what you're, what, that's what your clients are paying for. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so yeah, I mean, I'm obviously I help people set up their business, but you're right, it's about filling a gap because, you know, I think there comes a point where you suddenly realise that you can't do it all and you just do need to reach out sometimes. But um, so, so, so interesting. And then I was going to ask you guys, so my next question really was, so you both come from that public, public but, you know, we would say the corporate, but you, you had a box, basically, even if they weren't particularly... Great, but you were being managed, there was structure. Um, how did you suddenly find that when you're kind of your own boss? How does that dynamic work? I I mean, as, as Paul's already said, when I get a project in my head, I just want to do it. So work ethic, I mean, it kind of feels like we're cheating because we're doing so much less in terms of hours and work than we were when we were teaching, but we're kind of charging more which feels very very strange but it's um 
we put some quite clear boundaries in place to begin with. So when Paul joined the business, we we decided we were going to break on a Friday at lunchtime and we were going to have a Friday for the afternoon so that we guaranteed we had some quality time, however busy it got, that we we still had some us time as well. Yeah. So we we put those boundaries in place and that's that's been really quite good. We um yeah, we always eat lunch together and, and so on most days, I think nowadays. So it's it's evolved over time. To begin with, there was lots more to do. And now, unless I get myself in project mode, I can just tick through, you know, odds and ends each day and, and be quite choosy almost about how I spend my time. Yeah. But I think we spent more. I, so I, say, I certainly spent the first three or four months of, of working in the business kind of comparing what I would be doing if I was still working in a school and particularly the first of September, that first Monday back, whatever it is. Uh, I don't care which teacher you are, which school you're at, you're probably in the school sports hall uh, with all of your colleagues on a, because uh, the first day back is always about 86 degrees in the shade, it's boiling and school sports halls have got no moving <laughs> air and you've got to sit there and, and you've got to do um, uh, exam results. What's the PowerPoint to you? Uh, the teachers, uh, yeah, the, the boss will read a PowerPoint to you and uh, and you've got to go through uh, child protection stuff. That's a, a, an annual thing. And it's it's really important. I'm never going to say it's not, but it's always the same. It's always a PowerPoint that's read to you. And it's and I'm, I used to absolutely dread it and hate it. And whereas now you, you get to choose what you want to do. And yeah, obviously there is you know, some things need to be done sooner rather than later. And there's, there's priorities that we need to address. But that, that first September training day where um so our kids were on a slightly different schedule so it was fine they'd gone back but our our training day that would have been we instead booked ourselves in for a spa day and we went and did some business planning at the spa which it turns out really effective for us yeah no computers there's no phones there's nothing to distract us we just talk through lots of ideas so I think we got some really great yeah. stuff organized there in terms of planning but yeah we were just the whole day like we're at the spa and everyone else is sat in the training room. It yeah. made the whole day. But I think sometimes it's really, really important to be away from your work environment because it does stimulate creativity. It definitely does. Sometimes you just kind of become almost stultified if you're in that work environment and that's where you are all the time. Um, so I know, you know, obviously I've been in businesses where you would go away, but it, it is amazing what you achieve actually and how you start to think about things differently. But what about the delegation of roles and responsibilities between the two of you? That just fall naturally or did you have to, no. you find Emily, to be a bit of crossover? No, Emily is, uh, she, as we've already established, she's the ideas, she's, uh, you know, um, technical she does she's just so ridiculously productive and clever and so and she has these great ideas and i'm happy to uh, well uh, help facilitate the ideas if she says could you do x y and z i'll crack on in between making sure that she's fed and watered otherwise she would just be hunched over a computer and never move um so yeah it's generally i mean i i think it works out we know who's going to do what sounds like it, yeah, yeah. It's developed a lot as well over the, the three years. So Paul now does a lot of the one-to-one the -one stuff with people, you know, the mentoring, the, the personal statement work and stuff like that. He now tends to write all of the, the weekly emails um, as we're adding to bits because we made a slight change part way through that meant the ones we've written before needed just rewriting and squishing a bit. And there's all sorts of mentions in it called COVID, which we've yeah. written to everything, but obviously yeah. then we, we don't want to talk about it anymore. So we're... <laughs> Oh, I so, don't know. I don't think we should blot it completely out of our, um, no, you know, not, documentation but, yet. Yeah. But yeah, we, we've, um, I, I think, settled more into our roles and what we do. I, I'm not great at delegating things because I get a little bit control freakish slightly, but we have delegated some stuff. So quite early on, I think I decided that social media posts were driving me slightly mental. Right. And so we, we've outsourced that to a member of the team now who sets that stuff up for us. She is in charge of all the posts and things and she just runs them by me and it, it yeah. works. She's very good at it. So that a lot that took a big chunk off my plate so I could then focus on. Yeah. The it, is, it, it is something that most business owners find really difficult 
is yeah. to delegate because you know when you've set something up if you know it, it it's that can it, you are in control of it but obviously as it gets bigger you can't be doing everything and then actually that's not productive and good use of your time so but it is it is tricky it is a tricky thing <laughs> so um so uh let me have a look now uh i think we kind of covered one thing i wanted to ask you emily was you obviously went ahead in 2020 and wrote a book i did so that was another one of your was it one of those projects a little bit yeah um, was it, you, were you kind of forced I think you mentioned something earlier about bringing that project forward. So was it something you'd already contemplated? It was something that I, I think I'd always vaguely wanted to write a book, just, just you know, in my brain. Um, but I'd read Daniel Priestley's um, Key Person of Influence, um, which I loved. Great, great book. And thought, well, yeah, there's a lot of people. Uh, all of the stuff that we put together for the membership there are a lot of people who would benefit from that, almost a light version of that, you know, just in one place and all of the stuff that I'm always talking about anyway. So it, it actually flowed quite quickly. I think I, um, right. it only took a, a couple of, a couple of three months to put together, but it was, I mean, it was early doors of lockdown. And so, you know, we have teenagers in the house who mostly run themselves and, occasionally surfaced for food or when they needed to recharge a device of some kind and um and so I I just sat and wrote sometimes I had to go and sit and write in the garden for peace and quiet but yeah it uh, it just kind of worked and it's something that I, I quite enjoyed doing and uh, it's very very light-hearted very kind of laid-back relatable hopefully in terms of the the stories and the the facts that what I want to get across is parents we all blame ourselves we're all convinced we're doing a terrible job we're wrecking our children because we're not doing it right because that's how we all feel about it and that means you're doing it right because you care but there are little things that you can do that make a really big difference and the fact that you care enough to find out about this stuff means that you're doing it right you're doing a good job you're doing the right thing you're doing it well so that that reassurance for parents as well is something that i i wanted to get across and, and we've had some amazing feedback from it i mean the opportunities the doors it's opened have been insane. i was going to ask you about that so that really kind of was that really what helped you get all of that media coverage and everything partly um so good morning britain happened because one of our members had asked for um she'd asked for some support for her son who was going for an interview for something and, and Paul did some interview prep with him just you know because we like to go above and beyond and we we like to help and she then emailed afterwards to say thank you and it went really well and we got it by and, the way can I pay no she said can I pay you for your time and I was like no I because yeah. I was you know even though I did interview prep at school as a sixth form tutor and yeah, so it's something I've, I've, I'm, I think I'm very good at. I hadn't done it for a year. So I said, look, yeah, it's, it's, it's good practice for me. It'd be great for your son. Don't worry about it. She then came back with, oh, you're so lovely. Did I mention, by the way, that I am one of the, I think, segment producers on Good Morning Britain? Would you be interested in coming on and talking on results day? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I then panicked and then, no, no, really, yes, I can do this. So, uh, so yeah, it was just me sat staring at it was just Skype because you know we were still yeah. in, in lockdowns and things. So me staring at a screen and, and having a chat with uh, Kate Garraway and, and Alex Press. It was just it was fantastic, surreal, absolutely fantastic, but wonderful. And then um, we we have another virtual assistant she works for us for a couple of hours a week and when i wrote the book she was tasked with one thing which she immediately dubbed as celebrity mum stalking um which was getting in touch with people celebrities generally who have teenage kids who are about to do their their exams because we wanted some jacket quotes and, and someone to write the foreword so we managed between us to get a, a quote from claudia winkleman for the cover and a foreword from Terry Dwyer, who I'd grown up watching in Hollyoaks. So I was like, oh. And then um, she also got hold of Sinetra Saka from Ackley Bridge. She was Zoe from Casualty. And um, she got herself a copy of the book and got in touch. She was like, oh, I love this. This is brilliant. So I ended up having a, a half hour Zoom chat with 
Trisaka, where she just kept telling me how wonderful my book was and it was just <laughs> the biggest, most wonderful thing she's lovely and she then joined the membership so we've been able to kind of keep in touch with with the journey of her son and her, her stepdaughter so it's it's been really really wonderful just um and somebody yeah. described it as hilarious the book didn't they which is your yeah. finest finest moment so it's uh yeah. Not so much light. She described it as a comedy, a comedy and yeah. not in a sarcastic way was her exact phrase. <laughs> so, yeah. ah, so is there another another book in there, Emily? Uh, probably. I keep saying okay. I need to write the parent the post-16 survival guide for parents, but um other things keep getting in the way at the moment. So yeah. look, like, we are we are coming. I, I'm asking you so many questions and you're being very patient and it's just brilliant talking to you. So um, but I, I want to ask you, you know, you you've got work, uh, you've obviously got all your family, you've been writing. Now, one of the things is I love this, we've got to bring the cats in here. There was there's quite a few comments about your cats on online, but I'm not sure. Do you fit in your downtime? I mean, you said you went to a spa when you were planning, but how does that work these days? I know everyone likes to find out how people kind of chill when they're not at the cold face. Well, we've been doing a lot of uh, house renovation recently. I'm not sure that's described as chilling, but um, we spent nine months kind of taking a house that was not really much of a house and, and doing lots of work to it it's been a bit of a, a labor of love but that's taken a lot of time yes i've done um, a lot of playing with power tools yeah that's my happy <laughs> place my other happy place more instructions to read <laughs> overrated yeah. just just yeah play with yeah. power tools um yeah <laughs> and we we try and do things like you know when we sit and have lunch together we I mean, yeah. we ran up episodes and we were devastated but we were watching ted lasso which we came to a bit late so we binged it and just did you know one one a day at lunchtime as our sort of lunch date and uh, we're trying to find something new to do that with now but little things like that and um, i obviously have choir i like to read nice not just business books other stuff too and uh, and i quite like to vegetate in front of a terrible usually slightly teenage supernatural tv program Still, I'm re-watching Teen Wolf at the moment. I'm loving it. I, I need to switch my brain off. So it's either that or playing stupid games on my phone like Candy Crush and things because it gives my, my brain the space to go, oh, wait, we've got another good idea. Mm. And, and, yeah, we, we kind of go out to, yeah, this is the mm. Friday thing. If it isn't a Friday, we'll, you know, we can just go out to lunch and yeah. uh, treat ourselves and, and sort of not feel beholden to, because we can, you know, mm -hmm. if, if we have... Um, you know, something booked in clients booked in obviously nothing can happen but if, if both of us are free we can we can have that freedom just to nip out um you know things like the school run um easy to do there's no no difficulty there we can blend the school run in with going out somewhere and spending time together it's yeah it's just so uh, we are very blessed we, I know we we have worked hard to get where we are yeah it's been a, 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 an incredible three-year journey well at least three years three years since i yeah. started in the business and probably four years from from inception i guess um but it's been brilliant Loved yeah. every of it. Yeah. so it comes to my question about the vision what is your vision for the parent guide to education what's next guys well so many visions I, I, mainly here still. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually i mean we, we'd love to expand backwards so covering you know, how do you have your child when they first started secondary school you know talking about the transition between primary and secondary but also then potentially going further back it's not something that's within our um, you know zone of genius if you like but it would be something we then bring on someone else to be in charge of and, yeah. and cover that primary thing so that it is one stop one place for parents to come to for support all the way through the the whole process because it doesn't matter what age they are. I mean, you, you first have tiny people and their babies and toddlers and you've got mums and toddlers, you've got NCT, you've got all of the groups that are designed to support new mums, usually, and new dads occasionally. And um, by the time they get to be sort of even, you know, younger kids, definitely teenagers, there's just nothing. They mm. seem to assume that you know what you're doing by then. None of us do. That None of us. So so we want to be a place where parents can come to just right. what do i do how do i do this so that we can improve you know we, we spent 15 years 16 years each kind of thing in schools trying yeah. to shape education trying to make it all a better place 
And then we realized that we're kind of, we're fighting this giant behemoth monster thing. It's probably easier to do it from outside. And one yeah. of the things we can make a difference with is their learning time at home and their experience of all of that with their parents, because we can't change policy or at least, you know, not at the moment, but what we can do is we can make this whole process easier for yeah. families in general. So it's it's something we we definitely like to keep developing. We've started doing webinars for schools. So again, making it easier for schools to support parents. So we're setting up a bank of on-demand webinars, kind of like a little Netflix thing. Whereas as a school, you can go, year 10 are about to do mocks. They could probably use a webinar about mocks. Click, here you go, and, and just show it via a teams or a zoom or something I'll ask you then are our schools you know taking that up is that we're starting i mean we're, we're at the very beginning of this we've, we've oh, got okay. some, a pilot scheme going at the moment but yeah it's some schools did it for themselves over um over lockdown and things mostly so they could communicate with parents but generally schools mm. still will buy in a speaker for quite a lot more by the time you've done a few of them then they're going to end up paying with us or they'll get a, a staff member to do it. And firstly, talking to a, a room full of adults is very different to yeah. talking to a room full of kids. Yeah. But also, school staff are all overworked massively, <laughs> especially those that are experienced enough to, to lead that kind of thing. It's an additional mm -hmm. pressure that they don't need. And they can get that expertise from us. And mm -hmm. um, they can get it on demand so they can do as many webinars as they want. And they can have a whole program that parents can opt into. They can track it for offset. I mean, there's other issues in terms of obviously getting into a room full of people at the moment is, you know, it's still not a great idea. Yeah. So, um, and also to ask, let's say, 200 parents to all rock up to the, the school hall, there's a, a huge amount of petrol, diesel, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, there's a bigger picture to this rather than just making it easier for schools. I think a lot of parents are conscious of the fact that you know, rocking up to our parents evening, for example, you rock up and you might get your five, 10 minutes or whatever. Uh, and then you go all the way back home again, having again, wasted fuel. And uh, it's, you know, we're trying to do something that's going to help schools, help parents. Yeah. Um, and uh, we do think it's got, um, it's got major potential, but it's very early, early days. We did um, two or three webinars last term. Um, and, you know, uh, we only had 500 tickets available and they got snapped up more or less instantly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we know the demand is there. It's well, just a case of... The advantage as well to webinars is you can... Uh, you've had a long day at work and yeah. as a parent, do I then want to drag myself into school? No, I want to sit on the sofa in my pyjamas with a glass yeah. of wine. But you can do that while you watch the webinar. So you can kind of combine yeah. the two rather than having that additional pressure on your day. You know, can I get the kids fed before I go out? Who's in charge of the kids while I'm out? Do I have to drag them along and make them sit quietly? Mm, never good. So we think it solves a lot of problems. It's just, yeah. it's all, it's a whole new way of marketing to schools. Yes, yeah, definitely. Very different. So that's, that's one of our challenges at the moment is getting yeah. the yeah, but you are right. I think um, the one thing that lockdown did do was made people stop and think about all the things they were doing like that and even like commuting into work. So how, what are the things that we need to be doing that we don't need to be doing, you know, going to? But they're still equally important, don't get me wrong. But actually this travel thing that's all, all stressful quite often in itself, you know. Um, if they can do doctor's appointments online now, it's a bit easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, could you just please tell with Tracy listeners how they can contact you and find you? Um, so the best place to find us is usually on, on Facebook or on our website. So if you search Parent Guide to GCSE or Parent Guide to Post 16, depending on which stage you're at on Facebook, you'll find we've got a Facebook group, we've got a Facebook page, lots of useful information there and a really good community within the group as well of parents going through the same thing you are. Um, and then you can find information about all the things we do on parentguidetoeducation.com and um, with all sorts of bits and bobs. If you've got a child who is about to start their GCSEs or, or they're about to start year 11 and you're finding that it's a bit of a struggle, we've put together seven things that every parent should know about GCSEs, but schools won't tell you because they haven't got time. And you can find that at parentguidetoeducation.com forward slash the number seven things, seven things. Brilliant. Thank you.
Now, here I'm up to my final question. You'll be pleased to know. Um, but I always, always like to ask my guests, um, what is the one piece of advice they would give anyone else listening out there that might be thinking about setting up on their own or going to do something completely different? Uh, well, do it. Is, 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 yeah. one, but... so don't, uh, don't put it off. Um, we, we did for a year or two. We talked about it a lot. And I think if we'd have made the decision a little bit sooner, um, so my key bit of advice would be just go with it. Um, but also, if I can have two, uh, if you can get a partner in, in crime as cool as Emily, then you are uh, you are always going to be more You're successful. Still fine. I was going to say you. And um, yeah, I was going to say very similar. Uh, do it. Don't be afraid of failing because you will. And the first things you try won't work out magically because it doesn't. You don't suddenly put something out there and all of the people want it. You learn. That's that's how you do it. it think of it like riding a bike or learning to ski it's never going to be great to start with you're going to start out gently going to fall over a few times but it's worth persevering you've got to keep getting back up and getting back on because by the time you get to that point where things are starting to work smoothly oh so worth it i don't think i could ever be employed by anyone else again i quite like being my own boss <laughs> Well, that's a one of well, several pieces of advice. And I like that comment at the end that you, you know, you just love being working for yourself and being your own boss. I, I think that's truly kind of motivational for anyone out there thinking about doing it. So, Emily and Paul, uh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight this afternoon. It really has. And, you know, really interesting. I've not had anybody else on with Tracy podcast to do with education. So you're my first and you're going to be my first for series five. So I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, huge thanks. Well, well thank, thank you very much. Yes, yes, Loved it. Absolute delight.